Greetings. This is Dr. Tori Butler and welcome to Howling for Change. And on today, I have with us a prophet, a change agent, a phenomenal preacher, a prayer warrior, a little bit of a diplomat, a bridge builder, and the Episcopal leader of the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference and the Peninsula Delaware Annual Conference, Bishop Latrell Miller Easterling. Thank you so much for being with us on today. Oh, Dr. Butler, I am just excited and honored for the invitation. So thank you. Thank you, first of all, for creating this space. Thank you for creating opportunity for women of color to be seen, to be heard, to be included. So again, my joy and honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's let's dive in. So this mm -hmm. podcast is entitled Hollering for Change and Hollering is an Evolution of Lament. This is what um, A. Elaine Brown Crawford kind of tells us what happens when lament goes into the mouths of Black women. It becomes the holler. It's a place where we can name the pain in the room uh, with the expectation that God will and can respond. And so uh, part of lament is really giving voice to pain. And I noticed that throughout your career, that is what you've done. You have given voice to marginalized people. So how did you develop your voice? Did you ever feel you needed permission to speak out or cry out for injustice? Or was this just something that was always ingrained in you? So excellent questions. I think that there's always been something in my spirit that has been drawn to injustice. Um, whether I felt like someone was being mistreated so on a personal level, just watching someone be uh, bullied, uh, there's something in me that rises up, right? And and feels like I need to, to intervene. That's been with me for as long as I can remember. Um, and, and then I didn't necessarily need to find my voice so much because I felt like um, the women in my life mm -hmm. have been so outspoken. The women in my life never cowered, right? Or, or needed permission to speak, whether that was my grandmother, my mother, other strong female leaders in, in my life. And, and so never questioned whether or not I should be able to speak into a situation, speak into um, or speak about things that are happening. Uh, so you put those two things together, uh, just again, my spirit being drawn to injustice and, and feeling the need to intervene. And then just a, a cloud of witnesses of, of strong black women mm -hmm. who I just watch always know that, that it was all right for them to occupy the space that they were in and, and were ne was never gonna ask for permission about that. And, and I also think if I might, this notion of hollering being about lament, we have for so long gotten lament all wrong, mm -hmm. right? We, we have treated lament as, as if it is this very timid, sanitized conversation with God. That is not what lament ever meant, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to those who were, who were crafting what we call lamentations or even the Psalms. When they talk about crying out to God, they're not talking about in some soft voice. They were literally crying out, how long, Lord, how yeah. long? We have somehow made it such that if, if one's voice goes above a whisper, you're somehow being rude and, 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 and you're, you're, you know, you're offending God by raising your voice. So, so I think somehow intuitively black women have always just gotten it that it's all right for us to holler it's yeah. all right and 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 god is comfortable with that I, this that's a re i want to i want to kind of live into this moment really quickly so two two folds one uh, if you ever go back to judges 11 that's like one of the texts that i have lived in for a long time mm -hmm. uh we have jephthah's daughter and her girlfriends and and remember that she gets this unjust death sentence because her father's just, uh, just dumb. Yes. <laughs> without, yes. without, 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 you know. Um, but what she does, she takes her power back. 
she says, you know what? I'm going to have my own memorial service mm. and I'm going to grieve for my future. She says, because I'm still a virgin, but she's really saying, look, I'm going to go and grieve for my future because what you have said about my life, i.e. my life is now over. You mm -hmm. don't have a say in how I go now. And right. so she gathers her girlfriends together and then they go, he said, she says, let me gather them together and we're going to go and roam on the mountaintop for a couple of months yeah. and go leave us alone. And mm -hmm. in roaming, what do you think is going to happen at the top of a mountain if there's nobody else there? Sure. They're going to scream sure. from the from the depths of their bellies, from the top of their lungs to get right. out this pain. And, and that's what I love about Lament. It's individual and it's communal. And it, it invites all of us to yes. use our voices. Um, I, I, Like I want to, like I said, press in a little bit to sound. Um, I've heard you preach in church settings. I've heard you preach in the academy and your voice and your style were the same. It's very mm -hmm. distinct. It's very rhythmic. Um, it's prophetic in nature. Uh, sometimes you add in some $10 words with the 10 cent words. <laughs> and, <My mind>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I've noticed is that sometimes when we hear women preach, be they black women or white women, I've heard people dumb down their voices. You know how we're talking about just letting the sound live how you were just saying you know there's just something about black women that will just let the sound live but I've I've listened to women dial their sound down to be more um genteel if you will to be more palatable um but I've noticed like I said you have been consistent in your style no matter the location so how did you get confident in your style and can you also speak to a little bit uh, around not deciding to code switch in these places? Because, yeah, because I, like I said, I've listened to you in the academy and it sounded like a black church sermon when mm -hmm. I actually was expecting it to be um, a little bit more conversational. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, oh, she's, she's going to be more conversational. <laughs> it wasn't. It was, it was still academic. It was still deeply spiritual but you did not change your full self for the space. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow, that you packed a lot <laughs> into that. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm humbled that you've listened to my sermons. Let me just say that I'm humbled, right? Because mm -hmm. the fact that 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 any of us who are writing our own sermons and then taking in sermons would choose to listen to individuals. You know, we, one ought to just be humbled by that. And and I am. Um, I always have to go back to shorter African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is where I felt myself formally called into ministry, right? That's where I had that wrestling time of you know, I, I, God is speaking to me and I feel like God is speaking me into this. And I had the, the great joy of being on staff um, ultimately with uh, who is now Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. Oh, wow. She was on staff at Shorter and was uh, at that point obtaining her doctorate from ILIF School of Theology. So as she always says, what folk now pay good money for, we got for free because we met with her every other Saturday as those coming into ministry and got the benefit and the blessing of, of her wisdom. And she told us, find you know, so now again, this, this notion of finding your voice, figure out who you are as she said, because God knew who you were when God called you, right? So, so you don't have to create any new self. God very well knew who you were when God called you. God called your whole self to this. So no pretension, no need to, to remake yourself. God called you as you are. Settle into that and, and, and begin to preach. And so, so I had that grounding, right, from from somebody who who was bringing us, you know, that that homiletical edge. But then also, I just think you ought to have integrity in in who you are. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I'm preaching at, um, you know, some what one calls a high steeple church on Sunday morning. 
and then preaching at the town square on Sunday evening, there might not be some nuance to that, but pretty much it ought to hold, right? It, it ought to be able to hold wherever I am because I mean what I say and I say what I mean, right? The spirit has given me the, 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 the exegesis of the word, but the issues that we're struggling with, what the world needs to hear is the same, whether it's in that high steeple church or in the middle of us, as I said, the town square. So even though there, there probably is a little bit of nuance, the message ought to, to, to be able to, to have its own integrity. Um, and, and so th that's where I, I think that comes from. Again, you know, Dr. Fry Brown, when she would hear us preach, she said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You're trying to be so-and-so. Mm. The world already has that person. Yeah. God needs your voice your presence, your person to now offer a word. And so so we don't need 2.0 of, of whomever they were uh, uh, attempting to emulate. We yeah. need you. And so so I, I from day one in 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 my calling and in my um formation for preaching, I heard that and really believed that 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 there was truth in that and and that has carried me throughout my years in ministry. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Switching gears just a tad from moving from your voice to just um, the type of leader that you are. Mm -hmm. So during one annual conference, one of your sons was graduating from high school and you worked it out with Bishop Devadar to come and preside over some sessions for you so that you could go and be present with your son. Yes. And I remember thinking, oh my God, she is modeling for this whole annual conference. What does it mean for your family to be your first ministry? And so what advice would you give to clergy women, black clergy women specifically, who have embodied this trope of the strong black woman where we wear the weight of, mul wear the weight of multiple worlds on our shoulders, uh, who never put down the superwoman cape um, to be present with their families, be present for themselves, uh, what type of rhythms may you possibly have adopted over the years that have allowed you to care for yourself, your family, and now for two annual conferences? <laughs> so first of all, one just has to step back and think, um, what would it have meant to my son for me to tell him, I can't be there when you graduate because I have to preside at an annual conference. He might've said, okay, mom, I understand. I know that's important. He would have never forgotten that, mm -hmm. never. Yeah. Um, ministry is important. And there are times that I've had to sacrifice being with, with family. For instance, I'm just recently, my uh, mother-in-law mm -hmm. who suffered a stroke several months ago and is still recovering from that stroke. Um, still has a lot of, of the repercussions of that stroke. They gathered for her um, 80th birthday. Almost all the family was there. I was not able to be there because I simply had commitments that I could not break. So there are times I've had to sacrifice. But my son's graduation, you know, I was able to go visit her a few weeks before her birthday. So I did spend time with her, right? I, I was able to do that. I can't recreate my son's graduation. I can't do that. So I'm not going to miss that. And I don't believe that that says that I don't value the responsibilities I have as a servant leader. I don't think that that diminishes the importance of, of annual conference, but everybody ought to be able to understand we do have relationships. We do have other responsibilities. And family first has always been a marker of my leadership, family first. Everyone that's ever served with me knows that I mean that, I take that seriously. And so if I say it to others, yes, I, I certainly need to embody it myself. And so my son didn't need to have any concern as to whether or not he was gonna be able to look out in that crowd and see his family sitting there supporting him. Yeah. So, so, so we need to prioritize those covenants, those relationships that we have. My husband and I took vows with one another. We did that before God and before the congregation of witnesses that was there. 
that means something, right? And out of those vows, we have this family that means something. So, so I have to honor that. I think it would dishonor who I am as a spiritual leader if I didn't honor my family, that first strong covenant that I have. With respect to these capes that society wants to tell us we have to wear, we know that harkens back to the time, at least some of it harkens back to the time when, when in this country, we were forced into chattel slavery, right? And we had to go have our babies in the field and somebody would come and catch the baby, right? And we're just supposed to go on working uh, uh, for somebody else, never supposed to admit the pain that we're in, never supposed to. And perhaps if you were able to go lay down and give birth, you were certainly expected to get right back up. We're not in those chains anymore. Mm -hmm. And in some ways the cape has become just a different form of enslavement, a different kind of chain. We are not super women. We're bad, but we are not super women. And we are killing ourselves, trying to act as though we can be all things to all people. I don't know if you remember the sermon I preached where I talked about the donkey and the ass, right? The donkey. Um, and I, I talked about how, you know, it, it's actually a story, but ultimately uh, the, 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 the uh, crux of the story is, if you're gonna to try to please everybody, you might as well kiss your donkey goodbye because you can't, you cannot please everybody. And so we have to disabuse ourselves of the notion that that's even a legitimate requirement. It is not. Mm -hmm. And we need to live into the freedom that we have to understand we're smart enough to know when the work of ministry should be the priority, when self-care should be the priority and when family should be the priority. I, I fully feel like the first thing any minister ought to do when they get appointed to their new ministry setting is sit down with the leadership team. For us, that's the Staff Parish Relations Committee and say, here's the boundary, right? So that there's clear understanding from beginning. So I don't have to kind of play cat and mouse with what's gonna be okay, what's not gonna be okay. We need to have enough authority to say, yes, I'm here to serve, I'm gonna work hard right? I'm going to work hard. And here are my boundaries around what I'll need for my own self-care, how I'm going to love and take care of those who are in my life. Because if I don't do that, I can't be the best servant leader that you want me to be. So you don't want me to neglect those things because ultimately I will not be able to serve you as well. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. But I want to go back to what are rhythms you have in place? As you said, here's here's the structure of how for how do we as pastors need to do it in terms of okay, we got to talk to the SPRC. We have to make sure that we have clear understanding around our needs and communicate those needs. But right. how do you live this out on a daily? Um, your you know your your prayer time, your personal time. Like, do you have do you have a, a rhythm that you work through, and and what does that look like? Sure. I'm going to be real honest with you because I believe honesty is, yeah. is paramount. Yeah. Uh, COVID has messed with all of that, right? Um, and, yeah. and the ways that we, I don't know what I want to say, had to work or we allowed ourselves to be required to work during COVID. It sort of played with all of that because yeah. now we're on Zoom meetings as early as seven o'clock in the morning. And sometimes I'm not turning off my computer until 10, 1030 at night that's ludicrous. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just going to admit that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, but absent, you know, this kind of strange season that we find ourselves in, I really have tried to maintain a rhythm of getting up in the morning mm -hmm. and having that time of meditation, contemplative prayer. Okay. W which is slightly different than just, you know, saying I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray that, that, that real time of intentional contemplative prayer prayer. I have a couple of resources that I use regularly and I read those and I try to process what's been offered in that day. I may do some journaling based on that. Um, and then I, I, I try to do something that then also cares for the body. Again, yeah, COVID has messed with that a little bit. Okay. I'm not exercising the way I was before, but, but, but that's the rhythm. First, the spiritual self, then caring for the physical self, right? And all of that needs to be done before I start my work day, yeah. okay? 
Then beyond that, I try. Monday, I've always tried to preserve as a reading day. Okay. We must continue to read. We must continue to be curious. We must continue to stretch ourselves. If the last book you've read was in seminary, you know, shame for yeah. shame. We, yeah. We've got to stay in tune with what's what's being said right now. So I try to preserve Mondays for reading and some writing. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, full on work. Friday is Sabbath. Now, as I become an Episcopal leader, as I become a bishop, it's been harder to protect that Saturday. Mm -hmm. But um, but throughout my, my ministry, I've tried to protect, I mean, I just said Saturday, it's hard to protect that Friday. I've yeah. tried to protect Friday as a day when I am not engaged in any formal work of ministry. Because yeah. uh, we deserve that. And in, in actuality, we really should have two days, right? Who yeah. else in the working world doesn't have two days off, but at least that Friday. And and I try and that's really what my husband and I call date day. And you know, we got some advice a long time ago. We were we were straddling our days off. My husband was taking Monday, I was taking Friday, because we said, well, that will free us up more to have more time for the boys, mm -hmm. right? A clergy couple, another clergy couple said to us, stop it, stop it right now. Because you two need to continue to nurture your loving relationship with each other. And if he's running full on on Monday with the boys, you're running full on on Friday with the boys and you're working, you know, uh, Tuesday through Thursday and then also tied up at your churches Saturday and Sunday. Where's your time for each other? Mm -hmm. So we did a course correction and then we both now have uh, uh, Friday as our Sabbath. But as often as I can. I try to protect Monday for reading, Friday for Sabbath. I try to take a weekend off a month. Okay. I try, again, as a servant leader, not a, especially of two conferences now, I'm not always able to do that, but I try and I absolutely take my vacation. Mm -hmm. Now that is sacrosanct. These, these clergy who say, oh, I haven't had a vacation in so long, as if that's some badge of honor. What they're actually saying is, I'm not being a good leader. A good leader takes that time. You ought to have folks in your congregation who can lead. You ought to be able to find some retired minister, someone who can come in. And, and, and we have laity that are clamoring for the opportunity, CLMs, others who are you know begging for the opportunity. So uh, I, I wonder those who don't take vacation, if they don't have a bit of a Jesus complex. Um, because we have to take that time off. So that's that's sort of my personal rhythm of trying to really maintain care for myself and my spiritual life. Amen. And if I can give a little shameless plug, uh, if you are a part, if you are a pastor that's watching this, please volunteer your time to teach a certified lay servant class. Amen. Because if you teach the class, then you begin mm -hmm. to cultivate your own ministers and your own congregation that can lead things that you don't have to lead if you are just willing to dedicate a weekend. So that's Amen. a little, little shameless plug there. Oh, good word, Dr. Butler, good <laughs> word. <laughs> so um, going back in, um, thank you, because I, I thank you so much for giving um, just an honest and real response and 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 also talking about some some growing edges that has happened along the way in your marriage and in your life and and also being willing to speak to um, how some of us are still trying to find our way in this mm -hmm. kind of post-COVID world, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, well speaking of COVID, but mm -hmm. in, in the midst of COVID, we also, this country had also experienced um, a wave of racial injustice that kind of... Um, was broadcasted on every type of media, be it be it the newspaper, be it uh, CNN, MSNBC, uh, TikTok, everything, you know. And so during that time, during 2020, um, I got a chance to march with you. You mm -hmm. and a group of clergy, you and Bishop Buddy, Bishop Buddy is the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, led a group of clergy in protests in what's now called Black Lives Matter Plaza. Uh, we were standing in front of the National Guard. 
Um, it was a day that I'll never forget because I remember the moment where you and Bishop Buddy came together and you kind of hugged and it was this little apprehensive hug because we're still in the midst of COVID. But, and then it was a, a moment of strategizing on the fly. And then you led us in front of the National Guard. You actually stood between the National Guard and the protesters that were not clergy protesters were right behind you. And you led us in prayer. Um, your presence that day hollered for change mm -hmm. in a way like you embodied hollering that day. Mm -hmm. um, and you were just, you appeared to be fearless. Um, but... What do you remember about that day? Were you scared? Were you anxious? Uh, why is it important for the church to be involved in issues of social justice and showing up in spaces like that? Wow, again, first of all, you remember a lot. <laughs> you remember a lot. Um, that, that was an amazing day. Um, was I fearless? No. Okay. And let's talk about some practicalities here. Yeah. Because because as, as much as we're called to be bold, we're not called to be fools. Yeah. Okay. My life had been threatened because of some other stands that I had taken, some other things I had written. Right. Okay. So there, uh, and my family's life had been threatened at one point. Mm. So there are times when I have plain closed security with me. I just want to be transparent about that. And I had some folk with me that day, but you wouldn't have known who they were because right. they were not, you know, they were plain clothes. Absolutely. All right. And yet there is still a risk and a boldness in showing up at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, yes. there is a risk and a boldness in showing up at all. Um, there were folks who told us not to come to, to, to stay home. Um, there were persons in leadership who were saying this probably isn't the right time um, for leaders to be bringing people out, right, to make this kind of public witness. We know from the White House, there was a lot of, of rhetoric and things going on. We saw, we saw, see what happened on January 6th, right? Who knew if that kind of thing was going to, to uh, uh, happen as we were there, as you said, surrounded by, you know? Uh, protesters and National Guard that it, it, it you, you could feel right the tension in the air but we are not called to be timid yes so even if you have to go with plain clothes security mm -hmm. go if you feel you're called to do that because first of all we stand on the shoulders of those who risk their lives right to to to, to make a way for us, right? Through the blood of the slaughter. That's what we sing. Yes. It doesn't say you stand on the edge and look at the blood of the slaughter. It says through the blood of the slaughtered, right? And 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 we also know, right? This the the this scripture that we use all the time, yea, though I walk yes. through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And 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 so so if we feel called to those moments, we need to show up in those moments. It matters. It matters that we're there. It matters that we're lifting our voice. It matters that 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 we're reconnecting with the margins, right? Too much of ministry has come into the center where we know Christ was always on the margin. So we're connecting again with that margin when we're doing that. So no, I'd be a liar if I told you that I felt absolutely no fear, do it scared, right? As, as, as the memes say now, do it scared, do it afraid, but just do it, right? We, we, cannot, we cannot not live into those moments. And I pray we're not doing it for show, right? I pray we're not doing it to, to, to be posturing ourselves. I pray that if we are gonna do those things, we're doing it authentically because we really believe in the movement and the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, it, it is interesting. I, I got a call from a clergy person who uh, is in the Western North Carolina conference. And they shared with me that they were so discouraged by what they felt was the lack of response in our United Methodist Church, but also in the world that we're living in right now, in these United States, um, how, how much racism is on the rise again, how free people feel 
to discriminate and, and, and to just spew hatred, that they were ready to give up. But they said when they saw Bishop Buddy and I out there walking in, and as they put it, those streets, y'all yes. were out okay. those streets. Yes. Right? Like, you gave me the courage to go on. So we have no idea who we are encouraging in those moments as we're working through, again, our, our, our own fear, as we're working through our own anxiety, we yet have no idea who is going to be lifted and encouraged. So it's always bigger than us, right? It's always bigger than us. Um, yes. Um, I want to go back to security. Mm -hmm. And and I and I and I want to push into this a little bit because um, I'm a young black clergy woman. I've been doing this now for 13 years, but mm -hmm. part of my journey has been um, men being inappropriate mm -hmm. at different times and in different seasons of my life, um, yes. and serving you know serving God and serving the church. Yes. And so um, in this season, um, I'm at a church that does have security that does have you know, people that are intentional about walking me to my vehicle and, mm -hmm. and making sure that I'm, I'm you know, uh, in my car safely. Um, uh, if I preach out, they'll meet me at the church and meet me in the parking lot and ex and literally escort me in. And, and people don't necessarily know that they are security, right. like you're saying. Um, but how can we begin to talk about this issue around black women and being safe and the church's responsibility and to ensure their safety. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, you know, unfortunately we are not always seen as valuable enough to be protected. My Lord, mm -hmm. absolutely. Isn't that, isn't that a horrible yet honest accounting? We're not always seen as valuable enough to be protected. We see that lived out in so many ways. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm really having to think about how much I want to say right now. Yes, uh, certain certain young girls in society are protected as little princesses, right? And and it is it is obvious that they are precious. And then there are others who are, you know, treated as if they're just they're, they're little women. And and whatever happens to them happens, and you know, you whoa, you, you you've you've created a whole mood uh, with, with that uh -oh. with that with that question. Um, so first of all, whatever others are trying to tell us, we have to know who we are, right? Um, loving ourselves is more than just booking a spa treatment, right? Loving ourselves is knowing and honoring our own worth, despite what anybody else says or thinks. So we have to know that we're worthy. And so, and when we know that, then we can ask for what we need, right? Churches, it is amazing to me what churches will find the money to, to support and what they claim they don't have the money to support, yes. right? Um, and so more often than not, if we articulate a need and we are unequivocal, we don't come, you know, cowering. We don't come begging. We say, this is what I need. And here's why the resources can be found. Now, if one finds themselves in a church that really doesn't have it, then how do we begin to work together in networks, right? How do we rely on each other to come in and provide that presence for us until such time as the resources can be created to, to do it in a more formal way? But first of all, we, again, have to, we have to know that, that it's okay to ask for it mm. and, and, and do that with an expectation that it is going to be met because we are deserving. It is important. What congregation wants to know that their pastor was attacked, um, what was, was brutalized, uh, just trying to, 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 to be somewhere where they've been asked to be. And, and so, you know, we have to be bold enough to ask for what we need, knowing that, that it's deserved. Amen. 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 So Bishop, we have, we, <laughs> we've been hitting some hard questions and some hard <laughs> topics. Um, so this segment that, that you're going to be a part of is about black women first. Uh, so when we look at the history of the United Methodist Church, 
We know that the very first black female bishop was was elected in 1984. Yes. Then we don't have any other bishops until 2000, so the 16 years. years. 16 and years. then it took another 16 years yes. <laughs> to mm -hmm. elect four. Yes. And so, um, and you are, going back to you, you are the first woman to be elected to be the Episcopal leader of the Baltimore-Washington Annual Conference. You right. were also the first female pastor to serve at the historic Union United Methodist Church in Boston. Yes. And so as a first in these ministerial spaces and also kind of being a legacy of first, as we were talking about just being a Black female bishop in the United Methodist Church, um, what is something that you wish someone would have told you along the way, either about being a first or being a change agent in places that hadn't seen you yet? Mm -hmm. I want to use yet because the, the, the yet says that you're preparing the next one. It, that, exactly. So that that would be it. Um, one of the things that that I say regularly now is, as we are opening doors, whether we op opening them, whether we're, you know, breaking ceilings or whether we're busting the door down, how whatever uh, manner in which it's occurring, it only matters if we're making sure others come behind us. It only matters if that's the case. If we get there. And then we leave and we don't see us again mm. for some significant period of time. Our presence, we've not fully lived into the opportunity. Let me say it that way. Okay. So yes, 16 years, 16 years, but it didn't take another 16. No, it did not. Group, right. It it, the, the next time we were able to get to a jurisdictional conference, right. More African-American women were elected. And I'm not saying that solely because of us. Yeah. But but I think that that we've led in ways that have said, no, it's not OK that we've been elected and now you've done your duty for the next 16 years. No, 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 no. There's more room. Yes, there's plenty good room. Right. So so um, that's certainly the ethic that I carry now. I wish I'd had it earlier. In, okay. in my leadership, I certainly did make space for other women uh, at Union. I brought another uh, woman on staff. Um, she was in an internship program when she first started uh, working with me, uh, and we retained her on staff. She's still serving. She's not still serving union, but she's still serving in that conference. Uh, and she's Disciples of Christ. So she wasn't even United Methodist, right? But we, yeah. you know, uh, to, to, to say to the church, no, we need to keep her on after this internship, right? So union had not had a woman, then they had two. Yeah. All right. Ser serving on staff. Um, another person answered their call to ministry, another young woman who's now a deacon in the conference while I was there. So we need to make sure that we're not only um, walking into the calling that we have and assuming the space that has been prepared for us. How are we making sure we're preparing space for others? Mm. OK, so when all is said and done, what do you hope your legacy will be? I say all the time, you know, it's almost embarrassing when folks get up to read the Vitae or the bio, and perhaps you, you, you've you been present when I've said that's all fine, well, and good. But what I want you to remember about me is that I am a child of the living God. That's what I want to be remembered. And it, 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 one, one thing I can say, I may not have built new um, buildings, where I served, right, mm -hmm. um, may not have, you know, edifices named after me, but I guarantee you, everywhere I've ever been, discipleship has been deepened, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Individuals have said that it has impacted their spiritual lives and their relationship with God through Jesus Christ has been expanded and deepened. That's what I want my legacy to be. For me, um, you know, that's what matters. You know, that song, only what you do for Christ will last. Mm. And that's a way to end this conversation. Only what we do for Christ will last. Uh, thank you, Bishop Easterling, for your time. This is Hollering for Change. We are so grateful and thankful to highlight all of the dynamic women uh, during the month of March 
Uh, there's still more women that we have yet to know. And we mm -hmm. pray that you'll tune in and meet them soon. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you.